to work this with mules years ago. George and Tom Ritter are one of the last links to the way thousands of residents of Delhi and Green Townships made their living in the 19th and early 20th centuries. When Tom's grandfather bought this 25-acre farm in 1887 along Hillside Avenue, it lay entirely within the boundaries of Delhi Township. Today, this vegetable farm straddles Delhi and the Cincinnati neighborhood of Sailor Park. We had chickens, we had hogs we used to kill every year. And we had two mules we worked the farm with, plus an old fortune tractor. Above the Ritter farm on the hilltops of Delhi, life followed the same agricultural rhythms. On Anderson Ferry Road from Delhi to Foley Road, you probably would have seen five homes. Uh, the rest of it would have been farming. Bob Maddox, the owner of the Delhi Garden Center, comes from one of Delhi's oldest farming families, the Witterstatters. His great-grandmother's home, now the headquarters of the Delhi Historical Society, sits on busy Anderson Ferry Road. A lot of the were, were uh, truck crops, were, were vegetable crops. Uh, they weren't the big grain farms or anything like that. A lot of cattle, a lot of horses. Clint Seitz grew up on his family's 36-acre vegetable farm on Rapid Run Road. Born in 1918, he straddled the horse-drawn and motorized eras. Yes, I, I have plow with mules. It isn't a, a very good sight right in front of you to see the tail end of two mules, but, uh, uh, but they do the job much better than horses because they seem to, uh, to walk straighter, and uh, they, they, uh, if you can control them, uh, they do an excellent job. Every summer, the site's fields brimmed with vegetables, which his father trucked down to the commission houses on the Cincinnati Riverfront. He usually returned home with a load of manure. Well, <laughs> it, uh, we really didn't notice it. We handled manure so often that it, it didn't really matter. I mean, we handled the manure from our mules and from the cows that we had on the farm, and we also hauled very much manure, when, which was necessary to grow these vegetable crops. In 1912, Clint's father and grandmother began constructing a series of greenhouses. Ultimately, they put three acres under glass. For 39 uh, years, we grew only two crops of tomatoes. That's all we grew. We marketed uh, tomatoes in eight-pound baskets, and um, uh, we would grow uh, about uh, 10,000 uh, baskets of uh, tomatoes per acre. That would be 30,000 baskets in a spring crop. And then the fall crop, due to the fact that we had shorter days and, uh, and the, the crop was shorter, we would probably grow about half that amount. But what set a core of Delhi growers apart from the other truck farmers who ringed Cincinnati was their increasing concentration on growing flowers beginning in the 1870s. Linus Sailhorse's father discovered the potential profit in flowers. He was the engineer for the... Um the incline, probably show incline, and his dad was a farmer, see, so his, um, he asked his dad if he could grow a row of flowers alongside a potato patch, and when he got done, he made more money out of that one row of plants, one row of flowers, than grandpa made out of the whole field of potatoes. Between the mid-1870s and 1920, farmers erected modern steel and glass greenhouses over hundreds of acres of Delhi and Green Township farmland. Western Hills fruit and vegetable farmers took their crops to Finley and Court Street markets and the wholesale commission houses. Flower growers also took their crops downtown to the Jabez Elliott market on 6th Street, built in 1894. This was the only public market in the United States devoted exclusively to cut flowers. He took a lot of flowers uh, back in, in, in the early 1900s uh, down to the 6th Street flower market down there. Uh, he would take them down on a, he'd leave like about 4 o'clock in the morning, take them down on a horse and a wagon down Delhi Pike uh, and spend the whole day down there. It was a very long day, but most of his customers were uh, people that, that came in and bought the flowers in downtown Cincinnati. The Delhi floral growers became respected regionally and nationally as leaders in their profession. In 1889, several helped found the Cincinnati Florist Association. Richard Witterstatter became nationally known as the Carnation King for his work. 
The prominence of the Delhi growers helped attract the national show of the Society of American Florists to Cincinnati in 1909. This is the old-fashioned way. So I've been around here since 1938. The, everything has changed. Everything has changed. When my dad built this place in 25, um, he, um, he put the whole range in carnations. Well, they had a bad luck, and they all died, and then he went into snapdragons, and then he finally decided to go into these bedding plants. They've done away with cut flowers in this country. It's all shipped in. Everybody's in the bedding plants and pot plants. At one time, the growers in Western Hills concentrated almost exclusively on cut flowers. We used to grow a lot of them in Delhi. Well, this is one of the last crops in Delhi. We used to raise carnations and snapdragons, pompons, or daisy-type pompons, and um, we even grown a lot outside. But as years went on, they got cheaper from South America, and that's where a lot of them are being shipped in from now. The Robin family on Padretti Road is one of the few who still grows a significant variety of cut flowers, both for their florist shop and for wholesale florists elsewhere. In early spring, it is Austin Marias, Enchantment Lilies, and Snapdragons. Later, it will be Iris, Sunflowers, and Delphiniums. We're one of the very few greenhouses slash floors that can go into the back of the greenhouses, cut them, and then retail them out that same hour and send them out for the freshness, the quality, to our consumer. I like to grow snaps and see how big we can get them in that and stem length and everything. As family businesses now in their third and fourth generations, every Delhi grower holds on to a trace of their family's past. At Witterstatter's Garden Center, it's hydrangeas. Part of it, I think, is my father. He, it's, it's, one of, it's one he likes to grow. For color and for, for splash, it's, you can't find hardly anything that will give you that much of a, an oomph, a, a, a blast of color. It's a, it's a great product to have. But there is no doubt that today, for Delhi growers, selling bedding plants for people's yards and gardens is the centerpiece of their business. Basically, probably 80 to 90 percent of the money that garden centers and greenhouse people make that are actually profits are in the springtime. The changes in the floral industry go far beyond the shift from cut flowers to bedding flowers. Well, without plastic, I don't know what this industry would have done. I mean, it's just, that's another product that's just revolutionized, uh, made things so much easier. I mean, either with plastic uh, roofs on greenhouses to the tubes that you see, um, these little spaghetti tubes. I mean, you can run a plastic line, put holes, 400 holes in them, and water 400 plants in five or 10 minutes. Plastic has also replaced heavy, breakable clay pots with sturdy, lightweight plastic trays and pots, while modern machinery has replaced laborious hand planting with efficient machine planting. And modern science has transformed the flowers themselves. There is probably 70 to 80 varieties of poinsettias right now. Back when my grandfather was growing poinsettias, uh, there was like three or four varieties. Uh, we did not have a pink. All we had was white and about two or three varieties of red. Believe it or not, we start with our poinsettia season the middle of February. Right after Valentine's Day, we start building our stock plants so that we can take cuttings in the first part of June. So we are, we're only about six weeks that we don't have poinsettias on our property. Poinsettias are, uh, you know, they're our second season next to spring. Social forces are also at work changing the industry. Since the end of World War II, the pressures of suburbanization have made it tempting to sell off land once under glass for subdivisions of new suburban homes and commercial retail strips. On Delhi Pike, where our garden center was, there was only, there was five greenhouse operations on here and nothing else. And in the 1990s, supermarkets and national chain stores pose a real challenge. The supermarket, the impulse. People were an extra stop for our customers, and um, we have to be memorable for them to make that extra stop. Whatever the mass market are selling, we're looking for other products. 
We're looking for different products. We're looking for other garden stuff. Uh, instead of a, an impatient hanging basket, we're looking for a combination basket putting together. Stuff that they don't carry, stuff that's unique. And when it comes to creating special products and a unique chopping experience, Sue Bruns at the old greenhouse is on the cutting edge. If I had time and money, I would be a bird watcher and I would travel and I'd have my life list and I'd check off all these birds. But I've never been to Africa or Australia or places like that. So I can watch them here. Everybody comes in, the first question is, well, do any of them talk? They talk, they just don't talk the same language. And when it comes to flowers, the old greenhouse has its signature products as well. This is really fun, bougainvillea. I heard an advertisement on TV about the wave, catch the wave. This is a new petunia called purple wave. At the very top, the pointed leaf is an ornamental sweet potato. It actually does form a tuber. It is edible at the end of the season. You gotta get the right things together, things that are compatible in sunlight and water. Um, my husband basically does all of these, and he has a really good eye for color. Today, with specialized magazines, floral shows, and gardening programs that fill cable channels, customers have changed. I think the customers are far more educated because of the amount of publications that are out there. Um, they're uh, very much up to date, sometimes even ahead of us. They know varieties of plants that we have. We'll ask for specific things that I think 35 years ago, 36 years ago when I came around, it was uh, basically, there weren't that many varieties. There were petunias, geraniums, uh, a few impatiens, and that was it. In the 20th century, the greenhouse growers of Delhi and Green Townships transformed their communities into the floral capital of Ohio. As they move into the 21st century, the future lies with a new generation who first learned the business from their parents and grandparents. It's in our blood, I guess you would say. It's a lot of hard work, and there's some times that I wish I didn't like it, but it's, it's gratifying. It's a people, I'm a people person, so you meet your customers, and I'm very proud of our family and the history that we have in Delhi, and I guess that's why we want to continue on. It's agriculture, and it's a lot of it you'll find it's family-run businesses and, and you gotta love the, the work. If you don't love the work, it's not the work for you. The growing flowers is, is, uh, is something that gets in your blood and something that you really love to do. You can see what, what Mother Nature can do to a plant and you can watch a plant develop from a little baby cutting to a, to a beautiful thing. It's very difficult for me to, to uh, stay out of a greenhouse. I, I, when I travel, my wife and I travel, uh, every time I see a greenhouse, I want to go in and see what's inside of it.